sisters with us today. We're grateful, and we're grateful for the group from the American Legion to come and be with us. Thank you. And after we move uh, through this service and end here via flag dedication service over the cemetery, I believe. Is that right? And so I'm sure you'll want to stay for that. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 10, if you will, please. Revelation chapter 10. I want to read the first uh, uh, 11 chapters, which is, or verses, which is all of the chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. Verse 1. Everybody there, lift your Bibles up if you are. Good. That's just about everybody. Thank you. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as a pillow of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices, and when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. It'll be amazing to get to heaven and realize how much that God had revealed to John and other writers of the Scripture uh, that they didn't write down. In verse, verse 5, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. More literally, time no more, or no more delay. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. You can underline that. As he hath declared to his servants and prophets, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book. Go and take the little book and open it in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it. And eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it in my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues, and kings. The next thing on God's timetable is the rapture of the saints, the rapture of the church. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, John heard a voice say, Come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Now the church was prominent in the early chapters of the book of Revelation, and especially chapters 1 through 3. But the church is not mentioned again until Revelation 19 and 7, and it's called the Bride of Christ. Why no mention of the church in these last chapters from chapter 5 all the way through the Revelation? Why no mention of the church? Because the church is not on earth, it's in heaven it's already been raptured. It's already been, been taken out. And as we read and study the Revelation, we see three waves of the judgment of God upon this earth during the tribulation time. All three of them are framed the same way. First, we have a series of seven seals. And then second, the series of seven trumpets. Third, 
a series of seven, uh, seven uh, vows or seven bowls. And as you read that, you will see that each wave of the judgment of God upon this earth during the seven years of tribulation always intensified. And between the sixth and seventh judgments, there is always an interlude or a parenthetical event. A parenthetical event is an event that happens within the narrative. It doesn't advance the narrative, but it happens within the narrative. And you look at all three of these waves of the judgment of God, and in each one of them, between the sixth and the seventh chapter, there is always an interlude or a parenthetical event. And between the sixth and seventh trumpet, we have an interlude. In uh, chapter 10 through chapter 11 and verse 14. In those uh, verses, we have the two witnesses and also the angel and the little book. Just to mention about the two witnesses. The two witnesses are two men that will come from the dead and they will minister on this earth. They will lead, I believe, the 144,000 Jews that are saved during the tribulation in a great evangelistic outreach all across this earth. And no one can, no one can stop them. No one can hurt them for three and one half years. And they preach the word of God. And they preach the gospel of Christ and plead with people to come to the Lord. At the end of three and one half years, uh, they are killed by the Antichrist. And they lay in the streets of Jerusalem for three and one half days. At the end of three and one half days, they ascended into glory. They ascended into heaven. And the people that were there looked with amazement as they went into heaven. But I want our concern today to be with the angel and the little book. The angel with the little book made an announcement. He lifted up his hand to heaven and said, There should be no more delay. It is over. It is done with. No more delay. So first, the appearance of the strong angel. This mighty angel, the scripture says, came down from heaven. Now John has watched the unfolding of Jesus' revelation from heaven, but now... Beginning in Revelation 10, John was back on earth listening to the voice from heaven. And John said, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like a pillar of fire, and he had in his hand a little book which was open. He placed his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the land. This is the mighty angel. Now the description of this mighty angel. The mighty angel was robed or wrapped with a cloud. One commentator said that robed with a cloud shows that he came straight from the presence of God and the risen Christ because the clouds are the chariots of God for God is said to make the clouds his chariot. The commentator was, was referencing Psalms 104 and verse 3. And then the rainbow surrounded the angel's head as a symbol of God's mercy and God's faithfulness to his covenant promise in Genesis chapter 9 that he would never destroy this earth again with water. His face is like the sun. This is a symbol of the Shekinah God. His feet as a pillow of fire, symbol of the judgment of God. This angel is a glorious, glorious servant of God. There are those that say that this angel was the Lord Jesus Christ. I won't accept that because first of all, the Bible does not indicate to us that Jesus Christ is coming, uh, coming the third time. He's coming the first time in the rapture of the saints and he's coming, uh, coming the uh, uh, second part of that first coming to this earth with multitudes of servants and saints of God will follow him. It does not indicate, the Bible does not, that Jesus Christ will have a third uh, appearance. The second thing I want us to see now, this mighty angel demonstrates God's ownership of this earth. Look at verse 2. 
He set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. God is taking possession of this earth. God is taking back the earth from Satan. This angel was saying, this world is under the foot of God himself. God has not abandoned this nation and this world. God is still in control. It may seem like sometimes uh, that uh, Satan is totally and completely in control, but God is always in, in control. I got an email this week from uh, Dr. Jeffries, and, and here's what he said. Uh, I'm sure you've read the phrase, winning the battle but losing the war. It speaks to the fact that victory in the short term isn't necessarily a prediction of the final outcome. There is a bigger picture than what we are seeing on the news. It may appear that the enemy is winning at the moment, but there is a final conquest in which Jesus Christ will be revealed as victor. The ultimate showdown is described in the book of Revelation which God gave us that we will not, so that we will not despair when it appears that evil is triumphant, triumphing. We must underscore that God is sovereign, that God is in control, and regardless of what's happening in this world, our God is still on the throne, and it is no secret to Him. He knows exactly what is happening. In God's timing, the power of sin and darkness will will forever and ever go away. The long delay, the long delay is a mystery of God. We live with that mystery today. The long delay of our Lord that's mentioned in our text in verses 6 through 7. The mystery of God is seen in the thousands of years that sin and death has run wild. All of us have experienced dark and dark days. There's no life without tears and without sorrow. And there's no family that doesn't see the family circle dissolve in the depths of the grave. There is no life that doesn't end in death. From the time of the first murder until now, history records blood, death, and tears. For thousands of years... God has allowed Satan to wrap his vicious, his vicious and slimy and filthy and cruel hands around human life and all around this earth. And we say, God, where are you? Why so much evil in the world if you are God? If you are God of love, why did this let did you let this happen? How many times have we said that? You've said that. I've said that. I conducted a funeral back in the September of 021 of a young man, 27 years old, who had died of the uh, coronavirus. And I saw a picture. We had the funeral in the, at the cemetery, and the people were scattered out all over the cemetery, it seemed. And, and I saw the family. I was standing there at the head of the casket. I saw the family uh, coming in, and they sat on the chairs that faced uh, uh, the coffin. And uh, uh, he was a healthy young man. I saw the picture of him that had been taken uh, not long, just a month or two before he died. And he was a strong, healthy, handsome, good-looking young man that felt good. And then uh, he died with this virus. And I saw his family. And I saw them sitting there. And they were looking at the, at the ground. And their faces were long. And, and they were sad and, and brokenhearted. They didn't say it. But I know what they were saying. In their heart, they were saying, Why, Lord, why? Did this happen? Why did you let our son die? Why uh, did you take him? Why couldn't you have healed him? They were asking that question. Of course, I didn't have the answer to that. And they won't have the answer till they get to heaven. We don't know. But you know what happened? I just I want to share this with you as well while I'm uh, talking about this. Uh, you know what happened? I, I got home and, and several days, maybe a week passed, and I got a note of thanks as I do many times after I uh, 
conduct a funeral service and and there was a strange request, one that I had never gotten before in that, uh, in that note. And here's what that mother wrote to me. She said, Brother Lynn, would you mind sending me a copy of your sermon notes? I'd never had that done before. I never had that request. But I was gladly, gladly willing to send those notes to her. They were just the word of God. And you know why she wanted those notes? I'll tell you why. Because in that sermon, there was the preaching of the word of God and the comfort and the peace that God gives. And she wanted to have them at her, at her fingertips so that she could be reminded and could be reassured. Oh, we don't understand why we have so much trouble and so much difficulty in this life. And we often ask, Lord, where are you? Listen, Satan and evil seem to prevail everywhere. The infidel, the atheist, the agnostic, and the unbeliever laugh and mock at us. The enemies of righteousness rise in power. Biblical morals have no meaning to the vast majority of people. The enemy of righteousness spreads blood and darkness all over the face of the earth. In some countries, pastors are killed and are imprisoned and their churches, houses are burned. Christians by the millions are oppressed, living in despair and thousands being killed. Christians in America are being forced to, to violate their faith if they stay in business. Our government leaders lie and they cover up and they talk one way and do another. Satan is having a victory today. He's having victory after victory in the public arena. Many of our churches are embracing ungodly, immoral practices. Two or three of our mainline denominations have thrown the Bible, the Word of God, under the bus. And they've said, we're not going to engage the culture. We're going to join the culture. And we're going to start doing what they're doing and receive their ungodly lives into our church. The dean of the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. said, it is a sin to oppose the so-called gay lifestyle. And as you remember when our Supreme Court back a few years ago uh, ruled that same-sex marriage was the law of the land, that same church, National Cathedral, rung their bells, rung their bells in praise and glory because of that decision. We're seeing a, a repression of the preaching of the Word of God in public. A retired preacher or a retired police officer, that we is, was arrested for sharing the gospel in a New Jersey mall. He was taken and handcuffed and put in jail for preaching the Word of God. Back uh, last fall, I believe it was, uh, I was in Jackson, Tennessee. I was going south on 45 there uh, at the caution light where you turn left to go uh, on to 412 and on to Lexington. I was sitting there waiting for the traffic to clear and the light to change. And I, I looked over there and I saw something that I hadn't seen in, in many, many years. I saw a young, nice looking young man standing on the street corner there and he had his Bible open on that beautiful fall day and he was preaching the word of God right there on the corner and I saw those people that were lined up there they rolled they were rolling their glasses uh, car glasses down I rolled mine down and I listened to him just to make sure that I could get a get a feel of what he was saying and what he was saying was that, that you're to repent and that Jesus died for you and he'll save you and he'll keep you saved that what is that's what he was preaching I rejoiced at that but then I thought as I drove away, how long will it be in our nation? How long will it be in Jackson, Tennessee, when a man can stand on the street corner and preach the Word of God without being arrested and taken to jail for preaching the Word of God? I fear it won't be long. The mass majority of movies are brutal, sexually explicit and satanic. I don't know why God allows Satan and evil to darken our land. It's a great mystery to me. 
And Revelation 10, uh, the writer of Revelation said, it's a mystery. We live in God's delay. But this is one thing I do know, that somewhere in heaven, there's an angel with a trump in his hand. One day God will say to that angel, no more delay. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the mystery of God shall be finished. The long suffering of God shall end. And God will say to death, this is your last victim. And God will say to Satan, this is your last destruction. And God will say to evil, this is your last effort. And God will say to sin, this is your last waste and damnation. And God will say to the crooked politicians, you've lied and you've covered up for the last time. And God will say to the abortionist, you have killed your last unborn baby. And God will say to those who practice sexual perversion, your sinful lifestyle will be no more. God will say to the rapist and the child molester, you've raped and killed your last innocent victim. And God will say to the adulterer and the adulteress and the fornicator, you have defiled God's order of sexual purity for the the last time God will say to those who take God's name in vain, you've offered a profane prayer for the last time. God will say to the Christ rejectors, you've rejected me for the last time. God in his sovereignty has a boundary and in his delay will be no more. And the sounding of the voice of the seventh angel, Satan and all of his works will be overthrown. And the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Victory is coming. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. This world was not created by, by Christ. It was not only created by Christ, but it was created for Christ. History is moving toward the great com consummation day. A day when Christ will rule. A day when Christians will reign with Him. A day when Satan will be bound a thousand years and be cast into the lake of fire forever. But this final victorious day is not now. Not yet. We live in the days of delay. Days of suffering and sorrow. Days of tears and heartache and strife and conflict. In days of delay, God is molding us. And one day, we'll see Romans 8, 28 fulfilled. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. Simon Peter wrote, spoke about this delay just before those Christians were to experience the greatest, greatest persecution that any Christians at that time had ever experienced. In 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4, he warned them, they'll laugh at you. They'll make fun of you. They'll say, where is his coming? You've been preaching this for thousands of years and it's still the same. He said, don't let that bother you. Every generation of Christians think the delay will be during their generation. I believe for over 50 years it'd be in my generation. And I'm not in heaven yet, so it may still be in my generation. But every generation has believed that Jesus would come and it all be taken care of during their generation. But let me tell you, one generation sometime will be right. And God will come. And God will take over. It's a mystery. We can't understand it. But we should never listen and, but we should never, never be persuaded that the victory belongs to Satan. 
The victory belongs to God and His people. And one day the mighty angel will come from heaven and put one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea and, de and declare no more delay. It is over. It is done with. It is finished. The same word is used when Jesus died on the cross. He said, it is finished. It's the same word. Here he says, it is done. No more delay. That's the reason we can sing. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and forever. You say, Brother Lynn, what should I do? What are we to do now? What are we to do? I'll tell you. Make sure you're saved, make sure you know the Lord as your Savior. Make sure that your name is written down in heaven. Make sure that you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then the second thing, seek to know the will of God in your life. Don't spend your life just going here and there and nowhere and uh, thinking that you're going to be blessed of God. Listen, know the will of God for your life and rejoice in being in that will. And fill your mind, fill your soul with the Word of God. Search the Scriptures daily. Read the Word of God. When you're in trouble, read the Word of God. When you're saddened and depressed, read the Word of God. When you're hurting, read the Word of God. Read the Bible. Get the Word of God into your heart. And be faithful through a New Testament church. Make the service through the New Testament church priority in your life. And make sure that you give yourself to fervent prayer. To fervent prayer. Talking to God. Spending time with Him. Enjoying the blessings of communion with the Lord. And engage the culture. And stand firm on God's holy word. Engage the culture. Paul said, put on the whole armor of God in this evil day so you'll be able to stand. And when you've done all, stand. Literally, keep on standing. When you've done all, keep on standing. Keep on standing for God and His Word. And then Paul told as, as God told, uh, or Paul told Titus, that is, in uh, Titus chapter 8, verse 13, he said, or 3 and 13, he said, keep on looking, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Just keep looking. Keep looking. The word looking means a strong, expectant, Longing look every day. Look for His coming every day. And listen, my friends, you keep looking and one day you'll see Him. One day He will come. Keep looking. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He justified freely forever. One day He's coming. Oh, glorious day. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusted in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you saved? Are you trusted in the Lord? Let's all stand with our heads bowed. Our eyes closed as God speaks to our hearts today. I don't know what's on your heart. I don't know what God is saying. But let me tell you, God has the answer to your need. God has that. It may not be the way you want it. it. might not be your preference. But God has the answer. Do what God is saying in your heart right now, right this minute. You're lost. Oh, my dear friend, you need Jesus today. In this dark and sinful and ungodly world in which we're living, you need Jesus. You need to be saved. You need to have Christ in your heart. 
You need it today. Not tomorrow, but you need it right now. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have other decisions that you need to make. You come and do it. Dear Lord, as our penis begins to play and our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And you're speaking to our hearts right now. Help those to respond that you're speaking to, Lord. 